So thank you very much, uh, Piers. And I'm delighted to be here today representing uh, Professor Stephen Powis, who is the National Medical Director at uh, NHS England and sends his apologies. His attention has been drawn away to some other urgent issues, as I'm sure you can understand we face as we plan for the next few weeks ahead. Um, but I am thrilled, therefore, that Brexit presents an opportunity for me to come along and speak to you today. So uh, that's the first positive. Uh, no, I can't say that, can I? Right. Um, so at NHS England, my role as the National Clinical Lead for Innovation is to try and act as a figure in the centre that sort of gives permission to the system, connects it up, shows us the great things that are going on, tries to drive the life science economy in the UK, tries to make innovation happen so the latest, greatest things um, can be bought for the benefit of our patients. But before I start on what the title I was given, which is delivering on our long-term plan, which many of you will be familiar with, I would like to add my congratulations to peers to the 13 new fellows because it requires quite some resilience and persistence just to get to this stage, and you haven't even started. Because to get it to the next stage, you have to redouble your efforts and more, but that's what the NIA team are here for, and our AHSNs are for too. So you've all been through this really rigorous um, process over the last few months behind the scenes and in front of them and of course the innovations that have been selected align with some key themes we have at NHS England that are important to the long-term plan around prevention and earlier intervention around primary care and mental health and I think you're going to hear things from some of our speakers later um, on this afternoon. Now when I looked at the list of the 13 that have been selected um, I already knew five of them um, so who've crossed my path in one way or the other over the last few years. So the first one is Rick Pope, who's a consultant urologist at Guy's, and I don't know if it was a pleasure or a pain knowing me as a urology registrar at Guy's, but he did that, he let me go through, so it kind of all been bad. And, um, and now the situation's reversed, because Rick has been passionate about prostate cancer, prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment. He's um, uh, supervised a number of PhDs at Guy's and St. Thomas's in that area. And when he wanted to take forward this fantastic new innovation on local anaesthetic um, prostate biopsies, um, I was so supportive from the word go as a practicing urologist. I've been horrified that we still do trans rectal prostate biopsies, you know, the infection rates, the patient safety risk, transperineal was definitely the way to go, but the resource intensity of that was quite immense. So I'm really supportive of the work Rick has been doing, and I'm thrilled that he got onto the NIA. Rick is also on the Clinical Entrepreneur Programme, which is one of the programmes I help run at NHS England, in partnership with our AHSNs and others. But one of our other clinical entrepreneurs, Alex Young, is here as well, who joined our programme. And I was aware of his mixed reality uh, platform, uh, Verti, around helping people, not just uh, with their mental health, but preparing themselves in healthcare for the stresses and strains we're going to make. For far too long, have we separated physical and mental health and well-being? So I was delighted to see that Alex uh, got on the program. Now, um, Martin Withers from Droplet is here as well, over there, and I met Martin a year, two years ago, and I think we had a very hard conversation when we first met, didn't we? I, well, wasn't brutal, I wasn't I was open, when you, if you get some uh, time <laughs> mentoring with me, poor souls, um, you will find I will give you really open and honest and frank feedback. And if you suffer from cognitive dissonance, you, you, you won't succeed. But if you can openly reflect on that, as Martin did, and I suggested, he was absolutely right for this program. And the Droplet team are also supporting us on the Entrepreneur Program and has come on board as mentors. And they have a great thing around reminding people about drinking and hydration. I was really passionate about that. And then uh, Stephen Bork from Echo. Is he around today? Stephen here? There he is. So I think we first met at at a clinical entrepreneur event, and then we met at Founders Forum, and there are some people who are just resilient and persistent and go on and on, and they don't give up, despite the barriers that are put in front of them. And he is a great example 
of not just an entrepreneur, but a patient entrepreneur as well, who's passionate about taking his innovation forward. And I'm really supportive of that. And then Cosmin from Myra Rehab, and I was reflecting with Cosmin just upstairs a moment ago. I first met him before I started at NHS England, where he had long hair, a big sort of, it was all out here, and six years later, it's kind of reversed. He's had a haircut and I haven't for five or six years. So I'm not quite sure what that tells me, but he's still going. Physiotherapy and the gaming of it, it's so important, but I haven't seen anyone across the world manage to get that to scale. How we get our uh, citizens and patients active is a really important thing. And there are some connections I was thinking. We've got some young entrepreneurs on our program someone specialising in wall ball and some other things. So I think there's a good connection we can make there and that's what this is about. So the long-term plan. Well, we've been celebrating the 70th anniversary of the NHS this year, haven't we? But actually, the long-term plan is looking to the 80th anniversary as we step forward. And I was in Spain last week and speaking to various uh, clinicians and people from different parts of the Spanish government and they looked at envy at what the NHS was doing. Their system is modelled in the NHS and they said, you have a national strategy for the next 10 years. Wow, if only we could have that in Spain. So it's a really, I think it's a really great thing. And of course, it looks at how do we keep all the things that are great about the National Health Service in it? How do we relieve some of the very real pressures for those of us who are working in the system know are there but also how do we capitalize on the amazing medical advances and technology that is happening right now, some of which you can see today in this hall. And that's what the long-term plan is. It helps us deliver on that grand challenge of really, how do we future-proof our health system and service for the next 10 years? And many developed health economies are struggling to address that situation at the moment. But I think the long-term plan and NHS England think it can be delivered for three key reasons. We have funding certainty from the government on that, which we've really welcomed. Um, and there's been a consensus as we've written the long-term plan and we've involved patient groups and charitable groups and members of NHS staff and other organisations related to that. A consensus has come up that the NHS needs to change and move forward. And we welcome that. And then the third thing that makes us think we can deliver it is, do you know, almost everything that's in the long-term plan is already being delivered somewhere in the National Health Service, but it's not just delivered everywhere at the moment. And that, in part, is the job of our academic health science networks and other parts of the system to work together to show how we can join up those areas of excellence so everyone has access to uh, the latest, greatest things. Um, so the long-term plan has uh, been called realistic and practical and costed and detailed and phased and ambitious. Wow, I can't remember the last time a 120-page document from an organisation was reviewed and received like that. So I think it's a great thing. There are some great challenges we've set ourselves in. There are some great advances we want to take forward, whether it's new options to see your GP online or radical reforms, 30 million outpatients, that's a third of them, we want disrupted out of hospitals so they're delivered remotely in some way. That's a big ambition, but even more our ambitions in cancer, which you're going to hear some more about this afternoon, the proportion of people getting an earlier diagnosis. By 10 years' time, we want that to move from half of people with a diagnosis of cancer to three quarters. And I think that's a really bold ambition for us to have as we move forward. Now in research and innovation, which is the bit of NHS England I sit within, we know that hospitals and, uh, and primary care that are actively involved in research and innovation have better outcomes. That's been shown in studies. And also research and innovation is really important for our life sciences economy. Again, highlighted to me while we were in Spain last year, I think we have over 7,000 companies in our last um, uh, life science report in this sector. In Spain, it's 1,000, but 500 of those are just distributors. And they look at the UK and go, wow, all those research active, innovation active companies, what an opportunity. So I think sometimes we don't realize we do have a real opportunity here within the UK to do some really fantastic things to help us address the challenges. We've also made commitments in 
the research and innovation part of the long-term plan, that one million extra patients within the next five years will have been active participants in research, will have screened another 500,000 genomes, and we're going to speed up that innovation pipeline so things get through the process quicker, faster, smarter than before. Not easy. And the NIA is one of those fundamental things that are going to help us do that. We're also going to expand our real-world testing, our test bed program. Because the randomized controlled trials of the past that once served us very well, actually with all the data and all the other things coming out, we need to move to a system where we can look at what's really going on and adjust that real time. And test beds are our commitment to doing that. We're also going to accelerate the uptake of medical technology through a funding mandate, we're working on exactly what that will look like, um, for things that are ready to spread. They are proven to be safe, to be cost effective, to improve care, uh, and we're going to admit that. But the bit of the long-term plan that you will be unsurprised to hear that I am most excited about, for those of you who uh, want to turn to your copy, if you have it with you, page 77, 3.119, which I will read to you because I had to do no pushing to get this in the long-term plan. We will invest in spreading innovation between organizations. Innovators working in the NHS will continue to be supported through the Clinical Entrepreneur and National Innovation Accelerator programs. Through a major expansion, these will include those seeking to drive quality improvement through non-commercial models. Wow. The NIA has proven itself. It is in our next 10-year plan, so it is great that those who are on the NIA are here today on it. It is one of the mechanisms where we are going to deliver on the commitments we've made to our citizens of universal healthcare, high-quality, safe, cost-effective healthcare delivery. And lastly, of course, all this innovation is great, but we have to sell it to the rest of the world. The UK is just a small part of the global healthcare system, less than just 2% of the global healthcare market. So we're also working in partnership with Healthcare UK to help you export your ideas and take them globally. None of these are easy tasks. None of them can be done on our own, but in partnership together, I think we can really crack them. So to bring together my thoughts and reflections on the NIA of working at NHS England for the last uh, five years, as a frontline clinician who went to the center, I, I was used to clinicians coming up with ideas and trying to make them better and, and, and sort things out. But when I got to the centre, I realised, uh, having not experienced central government before really, um, this top-down approach, this perfect and plan approach that there is to things. And that's often the way in healthcare. We want to make sure it's as good as it can be before we release it and take it out there. And that was very different to the bottom-up approach I was used to on the front line as an innovative practical uh, clinician, this sort of launch and learn approach that I've always had, and I think lots of clinicians have. And you know, on the entrepreneur program, and when I did my uh, startups that I founded, that's the way the tech industry does it, this lean methodology. Let's test, let's trial, let's see what works. And when we see which iteration works, let's work on that and develop that and take that forward. So I've observed, I probably should be careful how I word this, but I think it's true there is a fear of failure in healthcare, isn't there? What is the penalty for following custom and practice? I'm unaware of one, but what is the penalty if you innovate, you do something new and it goes wrong? They can be quite severe for you or for your organization. <coughs> and that's this closed loop, top down approach, isn't it? It's this perfect and plan approach. But we need to move away from that, don't we? And I like the launch and learn approach, this lean startup. Let's conduct some tests and trials like in our test bed program, see what works, and try and take it forward. So I suppose the answer is we need a combination of both, really. We need the top-down permission, and that is what NHS England, our Academic Health Science Network, and our NIA are giving our innovators on this program, but also the bottom-up support, because we can't do it all for you. We need you to roll up your sleeves, get out of your seats, whether you're a mentor supporting the NIA, whether you're the NIA fellows or other people within the system to help us drive that forward. And in this dual approach, I really think we've got a chance of addressing the key challenges and delivering on our promise to our nation of a continued high quality healthcare system for the next 10 years to come and many more, hopefully.